She's a Grammy-nominated artist from Tennessee who has been hailed by the New York Times as one of America's most intriguing, fully formed new talents. Her 2021 release, The Moon and the Stars, Moon and Stars, Prescriptions for Dreamers, included two songs featuring legendary stack singer and Queen of Memphis soul, Carla Thomas one of which went on to be nominated for Best American Roots Song at the 2022 Grammy Awards. June is also a three-time Americana Music Award-nominated artist for 2014 Emerging Act of the Year and Album and Song of the Year at the, at, in 2021. A musician, singer, songwriter, poet, illustrator, actor, certified yoga and mindfulness meditation instructor and author. She honorably served as a turnaround artist working with students for the President's Committee for the Arts and Humanities and continues serving through the Kennedy Center. Her first book, Maps for the Modern World, was an Amazon number one bestseller in poetry and is a collection of lyrical poems and original illustrations about cultivating community, awareness and harmony with our surroundings as we move fearlessly towards our dreams. And if that wasn't enough, she is also an upcoming children's, she has an upcoming children's book that's coming out on November 1st. NPR World Cafe Nashville Sessions stated, when Valerie June enters a room, the air transforms. When she sings, her voice hits like an ocean wave and carries the listener along with it. With power and restraint, she uses her voice to its full effect. So FAI community, please give a very warm welcome to our keynote speaker, the incomparable Valerie June. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. I want to acknowledge that we're gathered on the land of the Kansas, the Chickapoo, the Osage, the Otus, the Missouri, the Potawatomi, the Sioux, the Shawnee, and the Wyandotte tribes. I'd also like to acknowledge the land that I come from, Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah. It is the land of the Chickasaw Nation, the Choctaw, and the Quapaw Nations. Though today is a sunny day out, I'm here by way of the icy roads of the Highway 61 down in Mississippi, where Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil to become the father of the blues. I drove those icy roads to be here with you today, passing three tractor trailer trucks that had been overturned along the side of the road and several other tragedies only to arrive at the city of Memphis on a day when we buried one of our own, Tyree Nichols. It just being a few days after the celebration every year of the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who, yes, the land of Memphis is where 55 years ago on April 4th, 1968, we lost him. He was one of the greatest dreamers this world has ever known, and he was brutally gunned down on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. That's just a few blocks away from the ancient waters of one of the world's largest mighty rivers. We call it the mighty Mississippi. With its muddy waters so thick and ancestor spirits as deeply rooted in the current as its fat bottom is and its body is rich and wide, this is a mighty river. And yes, I'm joining you here in Kansas City where the Missouri River flows down 
to St. Louis and meets up with the mighty Mississippi and together they form one of the Earth's longest river systems. It's the fourth longest river system in the world and it rolls on down to the Gulf of Mexico. I'm happy to be here with you as a believer. I believe that the water holds power and I believe that it carries messages to the mouths of every living being on this planet. I am a believer. So, I invite you to join me in dreaming of a new world and believing that the seeds that we plant here together as a folk community this week will reach the hearts of every creature on earth by way of the water. And how will it happen? Water is life. Water is breath. Water is air. And breath is life. And I am a believer. It's truly an honor that the Folk Alliance is contemplating sustainability in our rapidly changing world. And that you've chosen to highlight Memphis. But still, y'all know that you can't even begin to get into the soul of Memphis without addressing many of the challenges and issues we're grappling with today. While the systemic imbalances that we're facing every day seem to keep us all in chains and ties and bound to layers of antiquated practices and policies, the average person hardly has a moment to examine the underlying layers beyond race, beyond gender, beyond beliefs that are rapidly unraveling the world as we know it. While horror stories are featured in the media and told with little care for simultaneously highlighting mindful and empathetic possibilities for solutions, we constantly live on code red with fear-based thinking as our first response. We live on stories of fake news. We live on opinions and commentary versus facts. While we, the masses, feel unrepresented and have chosen to pick numbness and chill, thinking that we have no way to implement true change anymore, it is here that we find ourselves facing three of the most significantly challenging issues known in the existence of all of humanity. A global climate crisis, the technological hacking of the human mind and body, and the daily threat of nuclear war. Look into the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I ask how much of the technological future is influenced by how we treat each other. As algorithms learn our patterns, how do our interactions and our views of others shape how we could be treated in the coming times ourselves? As facial scanners learn to read our minds by examining the expressions on our faces, how would it even be possible for us to have or conceal an opinion that we currently call a democratic right? With our conversations dominated by gender, race, and beliefs, what will these battles mean when we are all made equal by unfortunate circumstances? Currently, we live in a technologically advanced world eager to explore the consciousness, emotions, and thoughts of our minds. The data that's collected can be used humanely for healing or it can be used for harm. We could use it to bring us together or to tear us apart. And there has never been a more critical time in history to examine ourselves and our relationship to those we may not 100% agree with, relate to, or even share the same ideas with. There's never been a more crucial time to strip ourselves naked of our prejudices and bias to see ourselves as a united human family. So far, artificial intelligence, it doesn't carry sentience, it can't feel. Our feelings are a superpower. It's a treasure to be a human, to be imperfect, to be flawed. Still, when it comes to cultivating unity and togetherness, we've never seen a more crucial time in the history of humankind than now. 
Now's the time to train ourselves to be more compassionate, and it is a practice. Now is the time to practice empathy. As scientists are sculpting AI technology behind closed doors in their angel white lab coats, we must ask ourselves, who do we want to be? How would we like to be treated in a world where we coexist with super intelligent beings, superior beings, supreme beings, the brightest, the fastest, the best? The thought processes that we adhere to now, those are the qualities and virtues that will shape the creations of our technological future. After hacking the gold, oil, and the reservoirs of our minds, we, will we then question the need for the wealthiest 1% to keep a semblance of humanity present on the planet? Why will they even need us? What will it even mean to pit race against race and uphold the illusionary benefits of white supremacy? Where there, there would be no longer a need for the masses to keep up a centuries-long charade of supremacy. Everyone will be an underdog. Everyone will be a nigger. Everyone will search for a crumb at the heel of the wealthiest shoe. Then what will our gender, age, matter? What will, it be, what are, will our beliefs matter? What will even be the value of a human life, a human life, in a world of superior intelligence? As Toni Morrison said, the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps us from doing our work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language, so you spend 20 years proving that you do. Somebody says your head in shape properly, so you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Somebody says you have no art, so you dredge that up. Somebody says you have no kingdoms, so you dredge that up. None of this is necessary. There will always be one more thing. There has never been a more critical time in history to examine ourselves and our relationship to those we may not 100% relate to or agree with or even share the same ideas with. So when do we begin to write a new story of a unified human existence? Who are we? And how do we want to be in this human experiment?
Water is life. Water is breath. As George Carlin said, pack your shit, folks, we're going away. <laughs> and we won't leave much of a trace either. Thank God for that. Maybe a little star phone, maybe just a little star phone. Yeah, the planet, it'll be here. And we'll be long gone. Just another failed mutation, just another closed end biological mistake. An evolutionary cold de sac. <laughs> the planet will shake us off like a bad case of fleas, a surface nuisance. Hmm. Maybe we won't be able to reduce emissions and our dependency on fossil fuels. Those scientists continuously show us the ways to change. Maybe it'll be too late and we will not be able to avoid the worst effects of climate change. Maybe it doesn't even matter if we pollute the planet with plastic from shore to shining shore. After all, Mother Earth is a survivor. But what we know of ancient civilizations of humanity is that they have been fleeting. Mother Earth's just fine. So maybe George Carlin was right when he said she'll shake us off like, bad, like a bad case of fleas. Yep, maybe we're fucked. Since the creation of the atomic bomb, we've lived with this threat. Since I was born in 1982, I'm very proud of my age. Yeah, I hit 40 and I was like, hell yeah. I can do another 40. I'm getting sidetracked. Since the creation of the atomic bomb, we've lived with the threat of nuclear extinction and who knows, maybe one day a maniac is going to escalate matters. Yep, maybe the world and humanity will end as we know it. And all I can ask you is this. Who do we want to be in the face of all of these threats of destruction? How do we want to leave the planet? Though many solutions to things are out of our control, is it possible for us to bind together in communities all throughout the world to leave this motherfucker ha happier and, and more harmonious than we found it? Because we found it in pretty rough shape. And if so, 
I want to ask you one more time, who do we want to be? How do we want to be treated? How do you want to be treated? How do you want to leave this world? Is it even possible to leave the world in a more loving way? Could we leave it by being even sweeter to each other than those who came before us? And are we responsible for anything anymore? Are we responsible for the good, the middle, or the bad? As a friend said to me, we live in a time when everyone's thinking they're woke. But the plastic there, that's not my fault. We live in a time where the atrocities of the past from, from the brutalities of colonization to slavery, yeah, that happened, we can acknowledge that now, thank God. But that wasn't me either, that was them. And we live in a time where the injustices of the present, from the confinement of living in a patriarchal society to the strain of holding up white supremacy exists, but that's not my fault, I'm not guilty. I dare say that I take full responsibility for all of that. Me, my little self. And what happens if we all do? We live in a time where we've evolved to acknowledge the past transgressions and the present injustices, but it wasn't me. What does it look like to take responsibility? What does it look like to own a personal contribution to these systems that stifle us? If you were born to planet Earth, then you are responsible for the things past, present, and future that are happening today. In recovery, they say the first step is to admit you have a problem. <laughs> it's beautiful to see all of us awakening to that admission of responsibility, but we just need to speed it up. As the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh said, my actions are my only true belongings. My actions are my only true belongings. I have a lot of shit, y'all. I got like clothes, I got closets and instruments and books and, but my actions are my only true belongings. By keeping us on code red and keeping us living in fear, we seek to constantly be aware of the next tragedy. That's what we've been trained for and it's a distraction. We live in a time when the wellness and meditation has become a $4.5 trillion industry, and many of us are still seeking a deeper spiritual solution to sustainable changes. From using crystals, to magic potions, to yoga, to meditations, all things I do every day. <laughs> we're spending billions of dollars because we're hungry for true wellness. But wellness cannot be purchased at our local health food stores. Wellness and mindfulness are actions. This is how we relate to one another when we go to the grocery store. How do we treat the people that are around us? This is how we relate to one another when we're in the long line at the coffee shop and I'm like, I need it, get out of the way. This is how we relate to each other when we sit impatiently in traffic and it's like, if you don't get your liver out in front of me. You know what I'm saying? And so I ask you, isn't it amazing to share this gorgeous planet with people from so many different cultures, with so many different beliefs and backgrounds and races? And how amazing is it that every race and culture on the planet comes to us bearing unique gifts? It's just so special. It's just like every person carries a gift that can bless other people. Every person, every being born has a gift. It's just a matter of do they know? And what is it? And when do they want to share it? And how? And will they have the courage and bravery and strength and support to? Just like every person carries that special gift, every nation and every culture also collectively bears gifts and blessings. The African-American culture, the Native American culture, the American culture, the European culture, there are blessings. And if we think of the relationship with nature that indigenous tribes have, they teach us how to respect the land. 
from creative things that they've made, like handicraft ceramics and woven cool fabrics. Every culture has a gift that makes our lives more beautiful. And without easily opening the gates to experience the gifts of all cultures, Earth is out of balance. We need all, every, and any positive light to fucking shine and shine now. <laughs> the evolution of humanity is at a point of no return when it comes to fearlessly radiating. This is all just a bunch of hippie shit coming out of my mouth unless we actually do something about it. So how do we begin to claim a new story and reshape the narrative and write a new narrative? What if it's as easy as starting where we are? We are here in this amazingly magical folk community with wizards and fairies everywhere. <laughs> Seriously. And we're sitting in the seat of abundance. I mean, it's raining golden drops. And we're catching platinum, people. And what if we begin with the revolutionary act of creating and making art? Revolutionary. What if we begin by calling forth Calling into being, cause I wish to see it all I think to myself. What if we begin by calling forth into existence a language of joy? Because what we say matters. Yes, I cuss, but I mindfully cuss. What we say matters, and if we're using a language of joy versus a language that elevates fears, then will that allow other hearts to open and be motivated and moved and inspired by this new story we're telling just by being in a folk community? And what if that community is multiplied by another community and another community and another community? I don't know. I might be saying, fuck what Washington's doing because we got it going on down here, little people. But I don't know, I might say we need to get in there and change policy too. Sidetracked once more. Both the historian Yuval Noah Harari and one of my favorite philosophers, Joseph Campbell, they both speak about the power of stories and myths. Whenever I talk about dreams and stories, people think I'm talking about like something soft, like a dream isn't tough and hard. They think it's just soft like a cloud or a cotton ball, this dream. But dreams are fierce. It took 55 years and we're still pushing to see Dr. King's dream for harmony as a reality. And it was that all of us would be judged by the content of our character and not the color of our skin. So what does that mean? It means if you're an asshole, you're going to be judged by being an asshole. And if you're a sweetie pie, you're going to be judged about being sweet. And nobody cares about what you look like on the outside. Yuval talks about how many things in our society are all based on a collective belief in stories. He says that money is just paper. But because we believe in its ability to be used to trade and buy things for us, like a banana at the store, then it's real. And because we believe in the idea of America, it's real. And be be because we collectively believe in democracy, it's real. These are not things we can go to the store and get or hold or touch. They're fictional in some fantasy vault somewhere in the ether, God knows where. But they're real, and they shape people's lives. All of these fictional stories that we have collectively dreamed up and wheeled into manifestation, collectively. It's one thing to be a dreamer out here on these streets trying to hustle and play music. It's another one 
When like minds come together and collectively dream for something powerful, beautiful, and revolutionary through art. It just shows the power of dreams when we collectively do that together. I'd like to read you a poem. This is a poem from Maps from Modern World, which is a book I wrote and came out a few years ago. This poem is called Collective Minds Eye. We rose to shores that felt like sinking sands, harvested seeds from brittle, barren land. We had no words when they said, take a stand. Our voices lost, horse sore, placed no demands. We scattered seeds in fields that can't be seen because we know with daily watering will come a flower rich winter to spring. Collective mind's eye creates everything. Our actions kept us steady on the grind. We could have spoken, but that would have taken too much time. We're ever forward shaping a new earth. Our moments numbered, each breath equals worth. They had them tied up all watching the news. They had them giving up all their rights to choose. They had them and they didn't even know the wheel of life breeds life and onward flow. Collective mind's eye must be center stage to halt a juggernaut of multi-centuries rage. Collective mind's eye, man against machine. Collective mind's eye creates everything. We have the power. In our community, it's so grand to receive awards like Grammys or even the Folk Alliance Honors. But if we're called to act, what are the rewards of also connecting our art with schools in our towns, with libraries or elder homes? What is it like to connect our art when it comes to being in nature in our community and supporting other, other communities and different organizations? When we're working in this way, our life and our artwork lives beyond us. It's working when we're not there. When we truly see and respect the role of women in society, then we've started on the road toward equality. When we can adorn our transgender and LGBTQIA community with flowers of love and affection, then we can begin to traverse and go down all of these awesome powers of he paths of healing. When we can look to the people of color as equals by writing laws and policies that, uphold, that eliminate systemic oppression, then we are no longer living in fear. We're no longer afraid of sharing the power and the knowledge that we have to move and to stimulate the masses. We refuse to be dumbed down with the academic epidemic of dope, dope sickness. I believe that we have this power. I want to ask you one more time, who are you and who do you want to be? Well, I'm a believer. I'm a dreamer. And yeah, I know it sounds soft and fluffy like a cotton ball. But everything this human made was once just somebody's dream. So won't you join me in dreaming a more loving world?
down to fresh. The day will come when you